Hello, and welcome to this week's Graphics Programming Virtual Meetup. Uh, we follow the Berlin Code of Conduct. We have a Discord you should join, a Twitter you should follow, and we just started, just started, we have a YouTube channel which we upload these recorded parts of the meetings to. Um, we did put up the last chapter already, so this image is out of date, but anyways. This uh, this week, we are covering chapters four and five of the VK Mini Path Tracer tutorial. It's covering command buffers and writing an image to a file. Links to the tutorial and source code is available online at these locations. So chapter four, command buffers. What? Uh, before I explain what a command buffer is, it is important to draw a bit of background info in about the Vulcan mental model, specifically on the execution of work, or like if you have a draw call, what does Vulcan do versus OpenGL? And to an extent, this applies to DirectX 11 versus DirectX 12 with probably some big caveats. But the gist is in OpenGL, if you give it, if you execute a draw call like GL draw, it is run immediately except it's not because the drivers can use the as if rule to delay that drawing, but the programming model is as if it had run right then. So the next command that gets executed, OpenGL function, that is, will act as if it was going to happen right after, um, which means that there's a bunch of implicit synchronization that happens to make sure that those calls that happen one after another actually happen one after another in the context of the GPU and running it. Um, in addition, there is a state machine that OpenGL has that you can set state and it will persist for the lifetime of your application. And if you change that state, you are updating it and that also goes into the immediate execution. So if you set some state like I want to bind this shader and then do this draw call, then you're going to do on the GPU, the GPU is going to set it up so that this shader will be used before the draw call is ex executed. In Vulkan land, it's the same actual functionality is being executed functionality. The same things are happening on the GPU, but the mental model you have about them is very different. Um, for one, nothing is immediately executed. Everything is recorded into lists of things to do and then manually submitted. So it's a bit like writing a, an order for a sandwich. You write out all the ingredients you want. You know, Do you want extra cheese? and you know, an extra slice of tomato or what that, and then you give it to the, the cashier or the, the person at the till, and then they make your sandwich and you get it later. Um, in addition, rather than everything being implicit, where the order of the commands is going to dictate when something will happen, in Vulkan, you don't get that nice, uh, nice property. You have to manually say, okay, this must happen before this will. There's a lot of nuance to that because it's not as simple as you must synchronize everything because there is plenty of implicit synchronization, but only for a certain couple of things. Um, and lastly, while Vulkan is not by and large a state machine, when you are recording your work, there is a state machine that goes on. You bind this pipeline, then you bind this descriptor set, and then you do a draw call. Those two binds will happen before that draw call happens. So there is that set of state. The difference is when you finish recording your, your, your list of work to do, all that state disappears. So there's no ambient state that transmits between each frame. So that's, that's really nice. But anyways, onto actual Vulkan command buffers. It's, it's, where we, it's where we do the work. We have a bunch, a Vulkan command buffer object the way we write data into it is using a VK CMD function. All Vulkan functions that write into command buffers have that prefix. It's, it's a very convenient thing to see because then you go, oh, this is for command buffer reporting rather than in general. There's also, no, not there's also, there are four major categories of commands that I consider. The first one being binding, which sets up the state for draw calls. Then you have the actual draw calls, but that's also the same as executing a shader. Um, draw call is just a very nice word to use, but invoking a shader would, been, would be in the same category. 
you have synchronization commands, which set up specific synchronization things you want to happen. Uh, the biggest one being barriers, but there's also events, which are less used. And lastly, the, this is the type of command that is very useful once you've finished doing your work or when you're starting to do your work, and that is copying data, transitioning your images, and it's definitely the um, less glamorous of the three because they're not a part of the big, oh, we're going to set some state up, or we're going to do some draw calls and execute, invoke some shaders. It's more just, okay, take image A and move it over here. Turn it into an RGB format. The command buffers are meant to be very quick to record in that any one of these functions that writes to the command buffer is mostly just writing some ints and floats and pointers and then it's updating uh, where is the next where is the next command going to be written to and command buffers generally are implemented in a monotonic increasing fashion so that you keep writing from the base of it and write until you, know, you finish writing it. And then when you're done with it, you can reset it back to the beginning and you can just write over it. So more information about command buffers. There is a lot I can say about synchronization, but the things that are implicitly synchronized are not going to be things we cover in this tutorial series. For the most part, that's things that happen inside a render pass and outside of a render pass, which I don't even think we have a chapter on, um, VK render pass, if you're curious, you can look it up. Uh, things outside of that, you pretty much have to define the synchronization for everything manually. Um, and when I say synchronization, I really just mean memory execution dependencies where if you have some memory here that's being written to by a shader, you have to manually specify that this shader that runs after it must have a barrier to keep them, or some sort of mechanism to keep them from writing over each other so you don't get data races. A cool property of command buffers is that you can record them in parallel. You have to do each recording in a separate thread. That way you don't write over each other's data. It's not something we're gonna cover in this tutorial. It's a very cool feature to have. And lastly, when you are finished recording your commands, you submit it to a queue using VKEQ submit. What is a queue, you may ask? Well, this is what a queue is. It's the place where you submit your work. It's the person who you'd hand your lunch order in, or your sandwich order into. The point uh, which the handoff between the CPU writing stuff to do work is and the GPU driver executing that work. Um, the queue name is a bit misleading in my opinion because computer science 101, programming 101 to uh, educational material, you'll come across the queue data structure which is a first in, first out. <laughs> make, sure, make sure I get that right. It's a first in, first out data structure. And while the drivers implement your implement v Vulkan queues in that fashion, as far as the application developer is concerned, it's just a place where you push your work. You push, you push, you push. You never pop from it. That's what the driver does. So it's more of like a port that you put your data through, your command buffers through. Um, there are multiple properties that a queue can have. It's really not, it's not properties, it's capabilities. It's graphics, compute, and transfer. Each of them hopefully are mostly descriptive about what kinds of things they are for, but to be more descriptive, a queue can support graphics commands or and or compute commands and or transfer commands. So, you could have a, a queue that only supports graphics commands, meaning you can only do draw calls and literally only draw calls. You could have a queue that does compute only, so shader, uh, compute shader invocations, and then you have another queue that only does transfer commands, like moving data from the CPU to the GPU. These different cap sets of capabilities are 
grouped into Q families. So a Q family has multiple, can have multiple queues in it, but all of those queues will have the same capabilities. Thankfully, almost all hardware has a, at least one queue that can do everything, compute graph, traffics, uh, graphics and transfer. So there's no like, oh, I need to think about, oh, if I'm gonna do compute work, I have to put on this queue, and if I have transfer work, I have to put on this queue, no. You just put it onto the one main queue. Um, this tutorial abbreviates them the GCT queue, uh, you could call it the Uber queue, but on desktop hardware, you almost you you always have this this queue. I I would I would go out on a limb and say you always have it. Um, so to get a command buffer, you have to allocate it from a command pool. A command pool is just a object that handles the memory backing of your command buffers. They are very simple to use, especially with our helpers, the NVVK make and, um, and friends. They're, they have flags that you can set to change how their behavior. For our needs, we don't have any special flags we want to set. Our queue that we, we because, because a command buffer is going to be submitted to a queue we want to state we have to we have to not want we have to state which queue family that command buffer can be submitted to but it's actually at a higher uh, a lower a lower higher level it's at a deeper level where the command pool itself is dedicated to a single queue family so this line right here q uh, mq gct is saying that this command pool will only be used for this queue family. So if we create a command buffer from it, we can only submit it to the queue that was provided here. You can allocate multiple command buffers from a command pool. That's fine. It's not strictly necessary. Uh, for a big fat game engine or renderer, this might be something you do, it might not. It all depends on what your usage patterns are. But for our purposes, we only need one command buffer and one command pool to allocate it from. So to allocate our command buffer, we call VK allocate command buffers. So we can allocate multiple of them if we want. We're just gonna need one, so we just specify one. We have our handle here, and that's where we write our command buffer that we're allocating. And we have this thing, this level, this command buffer level primary. So a command buffer can be either a primary command buffer or a secondary command buffer. The main purpose from what I gather and uh, understand for secondary command buffers is for multi-threading and parallel recording of command buffers. You have 10 threads, you have 10 threads recording command buffers, but you don't submit 10 set, you don't have to submit 10 separate command buffers. Instead, you can write them all or create them all as secondary command buffers, then you have one primary one which calls those secondary command buffers. And that way your primary command buffer is the only one that gets submitted and it calls into the secondary command buffers. It's a, it's a nice feature to have. It's not something we're gonna use and you have to be cautious of the second the limitation secondary command buffers have as well as some of the, um, I don't say ordering, but you call a secondary command buffer from a primary command buffer and there is some synchronization and guarantees that don't happen that you might think that would happen. So that's the thing to watch out for. Um, I've talked a lot about command buffers, but I haven't really mentioned about their life cycle, their expected start and middle middle points. Whenever you allocate a command buffer, it is just an uninitialized state, uninitial, initial, same difference in this case. Uh, there is a, if you want a much better description than what I'm giving here, the Vulcan spec, the chapter six, I believe, has a nice diagram that shows you all of the states a command buffer can be in and all of the transitions between them. This is a very quick rundown that mirrors what we're going to be doing on R uh, in our tutorial.
when it's in an initial state, you call begin on it to set it into the recording state. Now you can call, you can write instructions into this command buffer and record it. Once you're done recording it, you must put it into the end state. This, oh, you must put it into the executable state by calling end or bk end command buffer. This, this executable state means it is written, no one can change it, and it is now ready to be executed. When you submit that to the executable, or when you submit the command buffer in an executable state to a queue, it will turn it into a pending state. This pending state is a bit obnoxious because it's pending completion, but in your head, you're thinking, in my head, uh, I'm thinking it's pending submission to start working on the GPU. Like, you know, you're pending your request, and once you get your request accepted, um, you go, oh, okay, well, now I have my return. But really, it's just, it's waiting for the commands in it to finish executing. Um, I don't know if other people have found that annoying, but the naming is what it is. Once it ends, and the reason I say this is because once it finishes executing, it goes from pending back to executable and not to some finished state. And that's because you can resubmit command buffers multiple times. So it's, it's a big circle. It's a, it's a small circle and a big circle. Um, whenever there's an error, like, oh, you tried to submit the command buffer, but it failed, or you wrote some invalid command into it, or something else happened, it will be put into an invalid state, and then you pretty much have to start from the beginning again because an invalid state is invalid, and you can't do anything with it. Um, when you have a big, fat graphics renderer, you want to reuse command buffers whenever possible, but I don't mean reuse the content, I mean reuse the handle to write fresh commands into it. And so whenever you finish executing it and it's back uh, from the pending state into the executable, you start it again, you call begin on it and it goes back to the top where it goes back into the recording state. But, so now we actually, oh, I, ooh, I went way too far. Don't press the up arrow key, it's note to self. Okay, I just covered that. Okay, so we want to begin the command buffer now. We call begin command buffer. It's pretty self-explanatory there. What this is here is saying that we do not want the driver to be able to reuse a command buffer over and over, which is funny because we had just spent a whole slide talking about how we could do that, except we don't really want to do that. We just want to submit it once, and that's it. Um, more often, 90% of the time, I think this is what you want. There's very little, eh, there are use cases for resubmitting the same command buffer, but that's not what we're doing here. So we don't do that. So we just specify you don't do that. The implication of this is that if you do try to reuse this command buffer, it will reset it and you, ha you have to record it fresh. You can't let it, um, you, you can't just implicitly reuse it even though you set this flag. At least that's what drivers should do. Whether they do or not is not something I know. <laughs> we've, we've begun our command buffer. Now we can record into it. Uh, if you've made it this far into the tutorial, you've understood that we're not doing anything of consequence to actually create pixels. Now we're going to start doing stuff. We're going to fill the buffer we made in the previous chapter with the value 0.5f. So it will be gray, which is nice because it's an actual value rather than it just being zeros or uninitialized. So we're to do that, we're going to use this command fill buffer. Um, the, this is a function that exists, but I have not used personally because every time I've needed to fill a buffer, it's been an image and that image has a clear value that I set in some graphics pipeline stuff that we're not gonna cover in this tutorial. So I didn't actually know that there was this command, but it's very useful. It fills a command buffer, it fills a VK buffer with uh, um, starting at offset zero, going for this number of bytes with the value we want. But it only accepts a uint32, so we have to reinterpret cast it. 
which is just hacking around the, the C++ type system. I believe we could use um, C++20's bit cast here. Correct me if I'm wrong. I feel like that's a good use case for that um, new cast type, but um, regardless, we're... What? Uh, I don't think so. Okay. Well, maybe not. But anyways, we're filling it with a value of 0.5f, and that's what we want to have happen. Except there's a problem. We're going to execute the command inside the command buffer, not inside the command buffer, but we're going to write the command in the command buffer, and that's going to be executed on the GPU. And we're not actually going to make sure it's done. So when we finish the command buffer, and I haven't gotten to submission yet, but we're going to submit it and we're going to get our data back, except we have not made any sort of guarantee that the data we're going to be reading back is actually going to be the output of the, the VK command fill buffer. All we said is that the GPU should fill this. We haven't said that you need to make sure that those values that you've written are available for others. And that's what I mean by explicit synchronization. Vulkan doesn't guarantee that the memory you're writing to is going to be available for others to read from. The way we get around this, obviously, is to define, and I, I mentioned a little bit earlier, but to be more specific, we're going to use pipeline barriers to insert that desired order. Um, the tutorial text describes a bit more about pipeline barriers before showing you the code, but I felt it was nice to see the code before you get the explanation of as to what they are, because then you have a better understanding of what I'm trying to tell you about. So we have this memory barrier that is a barrier between memory, except it's not specific memory addresses, it's access scopes related to that memory. So we have transfer write destination as our source access mask and host read bit. So we're gonna have we have this barrier set up to make sure that we make the transfer rights available for anyone who is doing a host read. And you'll see the transfer pipeline stage is a specific operation where we have our transfer bit and our host bit because I don't have the command definition, but this is source, oops. This, is a, the, this line is for the source stage and this is the destination stage. So it's saying this, the stage that our memory barrier is going between is going to be from the host, from the, the transferring data to the GPU because we have to, um, do we have to transfer? Yes, we have to transfer because we have our 32-bit value, not 32, we have our uint32 value on the CPU and we need to make that transfer uh, visible. Um, so this looks complicated, and it is complicated. There is a whole bunch of null pointers and zeros here, and there's this, which is we have one memory barrier, and we give it the address of the memory barrier. Um, that's because this function takes a lot of parameters, and there's a lot to describe. Um, a pipeline barrier is the basic synchronization primitive used to define GPU work dependencies on other work on the GPU, generally revolving around the memory that work involves. In a generic draw a triangle with a rasterization pipeline, a lot of those guarantees are explicit because of the way the pipe, the pipeline, is, the um, graphics pipeline is set up, it doesn't need to make those ex uh, explicit because they're the expected thing to have happen. But in our compute shader land, where we don't have any of this explicit stuff, none of that is guaranteed. So if we want to have a shader, a compute shader, which writes out a buffer of 
you know, value, say, for some, simu um, some flocking simulation. Uh, and then we want to have a, another shader that reads from that buffer and draws an image as the, you know, the pixels that these, you know, these birds are in, then we have to set up a pipeline barrier saying that whenever this, whenever a compute shader ends writing to memory, then we can start working on the next one. Um, there is about three pages of text that, uh, in the tutorial that goes way more into the technical details. And I, I suggest you read that because anything I'm saying is liable to be transmogrified in subtle and unclear ways that make things worse. <laughs> um, and they, they are, in my strong opinion, very complicated in the hard part of Vulkan. It's because they're the most powerful part of it in many respects, because you're explicitly saying these things must happen before these, and you have, some, you have such specificity so that you can make it as um, fast as possible. You're using, um, you know, you're using a, a jeweler's uh, screwdriver for everything when if you just had a sledgehammer, that might be a lot faster, but it might work a lot worse. Um, so <laughs> there, there's just a lot to know. There are multiple types of barriers. While there is one pipeline barrier uh, command, it can accept memory barriers, which we saw earlier, buffer memory barriers, which allow you to specify ranges inside a buffer. That's the specificity I was mentioning. And there are image memory barriers, which not just allow you to say which images or which parts of an image, but also allow you to transition images from one layout to another. And that's useful because sometimes you want to re read, you want to write an image one way and then read it as another. Um, there's also a thing called queue ownership trans, yeah, queue ownership transfers where some memory is assigned to a queue and to get it accessible from another queue's command buffers, you have to transfer it explicitly. I'm not covering it any more than that. You can read up more about it. And there's there's just there's just a uh, a wealth of knowledge to learn about this subject. What's great is that this isn't even the only type of GPU synchronization available. There's events, and events are different, <laughs> but we don't use them, so I won't cover them. If there's one takeaway from that entire, I don't know, did I spend 15, 10 minutes talking about pipeline barriers? I could have spent an hour if I really wanted to, uh, is that all we need is these 10 lines and we get what we need. The optimal usage recommendations state that you should put as many barriers as you can into one um, pipeline barrier command, um, but it's much nicer to keep everything simple and I believe that's what this tutorial tries to follow. So we've, we've, done, all, we've done our draw, we've done our not drawing, our filling of a command buffer and we want to end that command buffer so we can then submit it. To end it, we call it end command buffer. Nice and succinct. Oh, did I skip over that? I believe I did. Um, I believe I skipped over this slide. So you may have seen the NVVK check macro a couple of places. Vulkan functions, if they return anything at all, they I believe in 99.9% .9 of the functions return VK result, an error code enum. It has a bunch of error codes that you can look for and then print out if like, if you get that error code, you can go, oh, I got VK error device lost. But the most common thing you'll get is VK success, which means success as it should obviously state. And this v NVVK check macro just checks for if the result is success. And since that's all we're trying to do, if it fails, we just want to crash the program. I believe this is, has an assert inside of it. I need to double check. Then if it fails, we just crash the program. And that's fine. VK null handle is a thing you may have seen in some code. It's a type alias for the value zero. It's like null, but in it's Vulkan's version of null, the capital N-U-L-L -L specifically. Um, because handles are just 
opaque uint 64 integers they are you know their their type is of zero uh, is as of an int in in a mental head but the way the header is implemented is as a pointer to a struct which means you can use null pointer in many cases because it is defined as a null it is defined as a pointer so you can insert null um, the reason to use null pointer instead of vk null handle is that when you have a Vulkan command that writes a handle data, uh, writes the handle into a local variable, like, um, yes, like this, this, this right here, this command buffer handle, we write into it by taking the address here. If this was an optional value, we could use a null pointer because this is a pointer parameter. And so I advocate using null pointer in those cases but if you have to initialize it, you can use null handle and they're basically interchangeable. But I just wanted to clarify that they're the same thing. They just, one's a C++ feature and the other is a Vulkan headers um, type. So now back to where we were, we want to submit the command buffer and we submit it by calling VKQ submit. We submit to a graphics queue we can have multiple submit infos if we want, and each submit info can contain multiple command buffers. We only have the one command buffer, so we only use the one. Here's our null handle, and I believe this is for the fence parameter, which I'll describe in a bit. And VKQ submit is, in almost all cases, a very expensive call to make. You want to do it as little as possible. You still need to do it, but if you can do if you have five command buffers for your frame, you should try to submit them all in one VKQ submit, if at all possible. If it's not, then it is, it is what it is. And I spent so much time talking about pipeline barriers and butchering how they're explained, yet we're not even actually through dealing with synchronization because while we've defined the memory order dependencies on the GPU, we still don't actually know when our commands are finished executing on the CPU. And that's a very common problem to have in Vulkan. It's a very asynchronous API. You submit work and at some time later, you, you find out whether it's done or not. There are multiple ways of which we can figure out when our work is done. And the way chosen in this tutorial is the easiest solution. It is this function vkq wait idle, and it sets the thread to sleep until that queue is finished doing everything that was submitted to it. It's it's the it's it's a it's not even a sledgehammer. It's like a jackhammer, where it's just you're gonna come hell or high water. There's only one thing this thread is gonna do, and it's gonna sleep until everything is done. Um, but since we only have one thing to do, that's perfectly fine. There is better solutions. Uh, you can have much more fine-grained uh, checking of whether a submission is finished executing, and that's using a VK fence. This VK fence is, uh, it's, it's a fence, and your thread, mm, Actually, is it more like a semaphore? God, Vulcan naming is confusing at times. Uh, I'm trying to like come with some you know analogy for a fence, and you, I'm thinking like a white picket fence. You walk up to, and then I'm like, well, that's not right. That's not how a fence works. What you do with a, I digress. What you do with a, Vul, a Vulcan VK fence is you create a fence and you give it to a VKQ submit function call. This fence is then attached to the submission. Whenever the submission is done, that VK fence is signaled. And so you can use that fence's value to determine whether you're done executing or not. There's a handy function called VK wait for fences, which like VK Q wait idle, waits the thread, puts it to sleep until that fence is signaled. The great thing about this is if you're like in a, you're constantly issuing, if you're constantly recording command buffers and submitting them to a queue, 
if you use VK QA idle, you wait for everything that was submitted to finish. With a fence, you can wait for just the thing you submitted, and that's great. Uh, you can also pull the uh, the fence with VK get fence status. And so if you just want to go once a frame or so, hey, is that fence done? No. Hey, is that fence done? No. Hey, is that fence done? Yes. Oh, great. Now we can do something with that. Um, but classic case of do the simple thing because the simple thing works and there's no reason to get complicated. I, I included this description of fence just as a more complete solution because if you ever start writing more complex Vulkan applications in terms of rendering things real time, this is important stuff to know. For this one-off computation, it's not quite necessary, strictly necessary. <laughs> so one last thing we got to do to this command buffer, and that's clean up. The tutorial states that, or <laughs> the tutorial makes you delete the command buffer from the command pool before destroying the command pool. But I'm pretty sure as long as the command buffer is completely finished executing, you can just delete the command pool and it's fine. Um, in fact, you could probably delete nothing and the operating system will clean up everything for you. I don't recommend you do it, but you could. And there's nothing the operating system could do about it other than, you know, chide you maybe in the validation layers. But we finally have our work done. And our output should be something along the lines of this. We're outputting the first four values. The code for this is in the previous chapter. And now we get the much, much, much nicer task of actually taking the data we've just filled and putting it onto the disk to be seen later. And I promise you this will be much, much shorter. We just have three steps, and it's not even really three because one of them is implicit and the other is just success. It's create an image and then write the data to the image. I think it's actually just one, one function call. Yeah. Uh, ooh, I, I missed it. Oops. Um, can I... Uh, where, is, where is the edit thing? Crap. Okay. Um, Oh well, because it's a header only, the image writing library we use in the tutorial is stbimagewrite.h. It is a single header file, so when one CPP file, you need to have this macro defined before you include the library. That's just standard header, header only library usage. And then we just need to change our printing code to this function called stbwrite. We have, a fun, we have a file name, and this gets printed to our current working directory. We have a width, a height, a bit depth, so not bit depth, a color channel count, so that's three. And then we give it the pointer to the data. And this is that GPU pointer that we talked about last week that points to some GPU memory address or is cached and is a local copy. But regardless, as far as SDB image write is, con uh, SDB, yeah, SDB image write is, con is concerned, it will get the data as it just reads from it, and this will write out our image, and we get this glorious gray box. <laughs> All that work for gray. I promise you next week we'll have much more interesting things to look at. There's one last adenum, and that's about color spaces and linearity and sRGB. While we did just write the value 0 0.5 for all color channels for the entire image, if we open that up in a image editing application, it might not be exactly 0 0.5 on grayscale. It might, it might likely be 188 out of 255 or, I don't know, 1.6 something rather. And 1.65? Yeah, maybe 1.7. That's because human eyes don't see linearly. We, we see this curve that isn't a straight line. It, bends somewhat and you'll hear the term gamma correction coming up with some things about correcting our output images to be better for our eye. As far as this tutorial is concerned, we do everything in linear space and then the final image output may or may not be transformed, morgified into an sRGB space or the color space or in other words a non-linear representation of color. <laughs>
uh, there's lots of finagling things to think about with color spaces. There's multiple color spaces. Um, sRGB is just a very popular one. Um, what's another one? Uh, a uh, ACES is the Academy F Color Standard. Uh, this is an E there, it stands for something. And that's another color space that you can look up and find out all sorts of fun information. But I think we, for the most part, don't need to worry too much to worry our little preds, little heads about it. So next week we're going to be covering compute shaders. So thank you for listening. Does anyone have any questions? I think Vulkan images like can deal with sRGB stuff. Yes, too. yes. Vulkan images, VK images specifically. Um, can do some of this stuff for us automatically. We're using VK buffers, so we don't get that automagic, and so we have to think about it harder. Well, if, ooh, yeah, DC, uh, another um, color space is uh, DCI P3 for high dynamic range stuff. What, when you get into high defin, high, not high definition, because that's that's a resolution. When you get into fancy stuff, you you really start going to get have to think about color spaces. Um, and I do not claim to be an expert, which is why I'm being somewhat vague in general about it. <laughs> um, well, if there's no more questions, and I think we're good for today.